When I've told people that Juno Diaz is opening our season, the response has always been, I love Juno Diaz. It's never, it's never a mild response like, oh, that's, that's nice, I like him, or, you know, that's great. It's always across the board, I love him. And to wit, we have a full house here at 11 a.m. on a Monday morning. So kudos to you for coming. You know, he's, he's just the best. And, and, and most writers, I don't, I, you know, a lot of writers can't do that. So indeed, Juno Diaz has one of the most distinctive and magnetic voices in contemporary fiction. He is a writer whose finely crafted works of fiction offer a powerful insight into the realities of the Caribbean diaspora, American assimilation, and lives lived between cultures. Born in the Dominican Republic and living in the United States since adolescence, Mr. Diaz writes from the vantage point of his own experience, eloquently unmasking the many challenges of the immigrant's life. He is the author of Drown, and The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Pulitzer Prize. This Is How You Lose Her is his most recent story collection. Of it, NPR writes, quote, the dark ferocity of each of these stories and the types of love it portrays is reason enough to celebrate this book. But this collection is also a major contribution to the short story form. It is an engrossing, ambitious book for readers who demand of their fiction both emotional precision and linguistic daring. Juno Diaz is the recipient of a Penn Malamud Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and last year was named MacArthur Genius. He is currently the Rudge and Nancy Allen Professor of Writing at MIT. Appearing in conversation this morning, with Mr. Diaz is Bay Area treasure Sean San Jose, co-founder and director of Campo Santo, a multicultural theater company that brings socially relevant plays to life, including the first plays by Juno Diaz, Dave Eggers, Dennis Johnson, and Jimmy Baca. Mr. San Jose is also program director of the performance program for San Francisco's oldest alternative arts space, Intersection for the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Juno Diaz and Sean San Jose to the JCCSF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you guys awake? <laughs> Everyone has coffee? You guys aren't awake? I can't hear anybody say anything. <laughs> this event with Juno Diaz, you gotta make some noise. This is not gonna be the quiet coffee table type reading conversation. So, follow in kind. You guys good for real though? <laughs> All right, great. Thank you guys for coming out. This is really exciting. Yeah to be here. Thank you to the JCC and, um, and um, thank you to Juno Diaz. It's really cool just to sit here with, with him. And um, um, I don't know, you want to just jump into it? Just hi, say hi. Um, of course, uh, for transparency's sake, Sean is an old friend of mine, someone who, uh, whose work I uh, deeply admire and respect here at, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, of course, among other projects, you know, how many of you guys have ever been to a production over uh, at Sean's company over at Campo Santo? Yeah, that's my shit. Every time I come here, I try to, you know, this time around, he doesn't have a show up, it's coming up. And uh, thank you guys for coming out. It's like, I was telling Sean, I just, I thought it was a, a, an error. Like, <laughs> like for real, like uh, 11 a.m., I just, I didn't believe it. So still, I'm very, I wanted to thank the JCC for having us and for all the folks who made this possible. And of course, for y'all who made their way out here at 11 a.m., Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're both up super early, so it's not that. It's just, I always thought, no literature before 6 p.m. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So let's do it, Sean. What do we got? Very cool. Well, um, welcome back to the Bay. Thank you, man. And um, I was just thinking a lot. I, I was just telling you, I was, um, I was in Cambridge for like a minute. And for someone that was, is, is, is from the Bay Area, it's, it's, 
it's, uh, I don't want to say it's frightening, but it's very different. You know what I mean? And um, it just also had me thinking a lot about your writing and how environment, city, geography, how does that inform you? Meaning, like, when you wrote the stories, is like, is it, does your mind vibe off of being in New York City and therefore you see everything around you that's in your stories or being in the isolation or imagine isolation of something like Cambridge help you yeah. zone in that way or do you bug out and go away or yeah I mean I know I can only imagine Sean your experience for someone who is profoundly steeped in a place like the Bay uh, Cambridge I think frightening would be the word yeah <laughs> um, I, I just I would argue if you grew up the way I did in New Jersey Cambridge is an extremely frightening place um, and it's okay I mean guys there's plenty of spaces in our country where um, these spaces, because of their composition and because of their specific histories, um, present us with kinds of challenges that we know are much more general than we like to admit. Yeah? It's like, you know, a place like the Bay hides a lot of its sort of more sinister operations, where a place like Cambridge, um, they're pretty open about some of their sinister aspects. And I think it, it all depends on, you know, your mileage may vary. A lot of people enjoy their economic violence behind their back. Other people enjoy their economic violence in front of them. And it really depends on how you, how you roll. Now, my sense of it is um, I've always found Cambridge to be a very difficult place for me um, to inspire any kind of work. Mm. Um, I'm my, you, you guys remember the Jesuits, and this is kind of a, a, yeah, this is kind of a quote that goes into circulation, not only partially for the pride of the Jesuit order, but also from like the Protestants who were felt so incredibly threatened by them. But you know that, that old Jesuit quote about, you know, give me a man for the first six years of his life. Do you guys remember that quote? Yeah. Anyway, the Jesuits basically say, give me a man for the first six years of his life and I have him forever, which is about their colossal kind of educational sort of doctrines and regimes. And I, but I think if we twist that around as an artist, um, certainly my first years in Santo Domingo and then my next 12 years in New Jersey form the vocabulary and certainly form the way that I think about community mm -hmm. and the way I write about community. Um, I don't have the apparatus to write about community in a way that isn't really, really diverse, doesn't have this kind of, this kind of colossal connection to uh, its space, you know? Um, and I, th I think that that's mostly what happens. When I think about being inspired, I'm always specifically inspired by the first 18 years of my life. Now, that doesn't mean that the other places don't come into it. I mean, I've written about Cambridge, I've written about you know, other spaces without any problems, but the real love, like when I close my eyes, the, the pages and the heart always return to New Jersey and San Domingo. What, what do you think that, that is? Do you, do you think part of that is to like, being an immigrant and like that we never really land in a place or is it your particular family or is it New Jersey? Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you know, I have a, a, a good case example because I have, we're five. We're five siblings and four of us were very, very, very close in age. And one of us, like, as in four of us were like in high school together, basically. Yeah. And, um, and one of them was born in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So my little brother, his name is Paul. <laughs> Fucking love it, yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. They're like Marisabella, Rafael, right. Juno, Marisa, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's 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 for real. That's textbook immigrant yes, stuff son. right there. Yes. <laughs> I was like, God, mom's aspirational logic at that moment. It's so, some you know, phone book shit too. <laughs> oh no, no, fuck that. My mom is like a Catholic phone book. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's like, my mom's sort of naming uh, habit comes from popes, you know? 
She got that one. She didn't get the rest of us, you know? <laughs> so, but you know, what you're saying is, I, I've got a good example of how we can never be too deterministic about any experience, even something that we can all agree upon is incredibly traumatic, like immigration. Like, we can agree. I mean, some of us probably can't agree because we have no imaginary around immigration, but immigration is a profoundly traumatic experience, you know? Uh, it's what we would call a normative traumatic experience, where we've, unlike, say, war, we tend to think of it something that children should just swallow and shut the fuck up about. You know, we don't make any special concessions for this profoundly traumatic experience. We really don't. Neither, most parents don't, and certainly most institutions don't. But I look at my family members, and I think that, um, I look at the reactions, and the reactions were so diverse to that experience. Mm. My brothers felt no connections to New Jersey and no connections to the Dominican Republic. One of them was born in the United States, born in New Jersey, never left it till he became an adult. The other one spent more time in the Dominican Republic than I did. You know, my two sisters, one of them basically became African American and never looked back. You know, yeah. no, for real. I mean, that's my laugh, but. If you're from a category that this nation has decided in its delusional derangements that these people are permanent outsiders. So if you're a Latino right. or if you're an Asian American, which is two categories that this country has decided are permanent outsiders, no matter how many generations they've been here, people are always like, well, where are you from? And I'm like, Pocahontas, where are you from? <laughs> you know? And I think that if you're, from, if you're from these groups, yeah, I mean, if you're from these groups, you must know the deep longing that people have for an identity that allows them to stabilize. Mm. I think I've never blamed my sister for that movement because I think it's, it's enormously excruciating to live in an identity in a country that views you always as a constant question. And so I could see why my sister made that jump. Because as an African American, no one ever has any questions to my sister about her belonging in a certain kind of context. Mm. To think that that was preferable speaks to these other categories very powerfully. You know? Mm. In that, I mean, that's a deep thing, in that gradation of how a family sees themselves and how you place yourself in a family. Yeah, I was Part of it is just phenotype and things like that. But in terms of your, I guess, the yeah. epiphany of it, when did, did, you know what I mean? Like, did that, is that something that happened through writing or you were just on no. some different stuff with the rest of the family? I was the one who missed Santo Domingo. I was the one who took it hard. And whatever, you know, I just, I, guys, I know this is, you know, I know that we have an enormous sense of pride in our sort of storied, colossal accumulations, but I wasn't super impressed, yo. Like, I came to the US and I was just like, okay, you guys got the lights on, but y'all fucking hate each other, you know? No, I, I mean that as a kid, as a kid, if you encounter, look, I don't think people understand how absolutely different the fiber of a young person's experience in the United States is. And we tend to assume it's the same everywhere else. When I was in school in the Dominican Republic, people weren't raised on this. We had a lot of other problems. But that kind of ferocious, cannibalistic competition mm. which children are raised under so that very quickly in kindergarten, everybody knows who are the winners or the losers. That's just not an experience that we were accustomed to. I still work every month, go to the high schools with predominantly Dominican kids, and the ones who arrived to the United States always tell me the same thing. No one told me it was going to be this horrible, the schools. That everyone spends all their time picking on you, trying to figure out a way to designate you as a loser. And so I guess there was a part of me, the experience was difficult. And there's a part of me, though, who also just valued things and people in the Dominican Republic that I didn't like losing. I really liked my grandparents. I was raised by my grandparents. My mom worked all the time. So if you're raised by your grandparents and they suddenly disappear on you, I mean, I couldn't help it. My grandparents were in many ways my emotional core. 
And I think I linked them to the Dominican Republic. They became Santo Domingo to me. Mm -hmm. And my longing of keeping them alive was a longing of a young person keeping alive the people that they love the most, you know? And I think that that's part of, maybe my siblings loved them just as much, but it was easier to put that away. I guess I didn't mind grieving all those years. I preferred grieving to losing them permanently, it seems. Mm. Where yeah. do you fall in the family? In exactly the in the middle. In the middle, yeah. There's a <coughs> sister, brother, me, sister, brother. Yeah. Do you think if you can look back at, at yourself, like the way you look back at it, though, like this, this notion of like, I'm different, or I, I'm different in this country, first of all, but I'm also different in my, in my family, in my connection to my past. Do you think that was like you described? Like you landed here and you, it was an instant homesickness or heart sickness? Or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I also arrived in a community that was very much like me. So after the initial shock and all the stuff that we terrorized, you know, immigrants with, of like you got an accent, you don't speak, you know, your, your haircut, your clothes are strange. I mean, I was just surrounded by Latinos and African Americans. I was like, oh, here we go. This is familiar. Different language, different channel, different temperature, but familiar enough, you know? I mean, I, th I think certainly I, f I felt, after the initial shock, I felt like my community in New Jersey was a great haven, which is why I feel so close to it still, because, you know, then encountering larger America, I was like, oh, larger America, this is even worse than I thought, you know? Yeah. And so, certainly there was a part of me who didn't feel too much, didn't feel entirely an outsider in my community because in some ways I fit in, um, in some ways. But I certainly, that, the memory, the longing, the, you know, the attachment to the home nation, I think is something that was in my family. Uh, I knew there was something the matter of it because I didn't talk about it. There wasn't a space in our family to be like, this is valuable. Most immigrants, the experience is so wrenching that you're going to try to keep that off the table because to open up that conversation would be to have more pain visible than most of us can really withstand. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, there was a, you know, I think every young person feels a bit of a freak, you know? It's the nature of youth to feel like a freak. But... Um, I've always sort of known as well that there was also a lot of stuff that made me feel very strongly connected as well that I think is an, helped me both as an artist and a person. Yeah. And then is it too easy to say that at some point in your young life you, you, you started to sketch out these narratives that were able to, what, what was it, reveal that stuff or excavate that or was it just to put voice to you? what felt like a unique experience. And especially if yeah. you know, anyone looked, everyone's read Drown, right, and the stories in that, which do almost what you're saying, both, what is the new phrase that people say, toggle between the, the Dominican and New Jersey. Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's, Sean, I think that one of the things that happens for me was, um, I think that there's a part of me that was satisfied with living with the kind of s reductive simplification we're often asked to live. There's a part of me that was satisfied with being like, I am from New Jersey. Don't ask me about Santo Domingo. There was a part of me that was kind of simplify, uh, happy living with the concepts of, oh, look, look at the way everybody in my town, no matter what color or race they are, is always trying to date lighter skinned people than them. You know, I'm satisfied with this. I don't need to think about it or talk about it, you know? And yet that there was a part of me inside that was profoundly dissatisfied, yeah? I think I always felt like I had this mask with a lot of operational ability, which is to say I could operate well in the larger world once I shook off my initial immigration but there was a part of me inside that was in stark revolt from all the stuff that I was trying to swallow to fit in and just to be at ease with. And I think that many of us wrestle with stuff, you know? It's like we can simultaneously be cool with oppression and yet a part of us just be revolted by it. 
Right. And I think it's not, it's not enough to imagine that we're for and against. For me, the question is always how much is for and how much is against. And I think that writing, being an artist, was a way for me to begin to bear witness to the reality that I was not only observing and experiencing, but feeling at a somatic level. Mm. You know, that there wasn't any space anywhere, even in my personality for you know, because sometimes we get satisfied with shit, and it's like, I mean, come on, guys. How many of us are in a happy-ass relationship or in a happy-ass thing, but we, so we're like, you know what? I'm happy. Why do I need to fight that old fight about right. rape? You know? And at this moment, we're in this relationship. We're, like, happy. You're like, you know what? I'm going to put that weapon down because I'm happy, but it's a part of us that needs to be born witness to that needs to fight that fight for rape, mm. even if it's going to upset the present happiness. And I think my writing, in some ways, my writing was a me that, that had no space in the larger society, that didn't have any companionship in the larger society. Because it wasn't like people around me were like, hey, let's talk about how come we all hate ourselves. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yay. <laughs> you know? Let's talk about how come all the dudes I know are doing X, Y, and Z. There wasn't space for that, but it was a part of me that needed somewhere to be able to bear witness to this. Because if you can't bear witness to what's happening in the privacy of your own soul, which was what most mm -hmm. of us are most afraid to do, you know, because the easiest step is bearing witness in public. We often think of that as the hardest step, right? We often think like, Stopping the conversation at work and saying, yo, this fucking race or sex bullshit is bullshit. That's, that's not half as hard as bearing it inside yourself. And I think my writing just opened the space for me to do that. You know, I found in my art, in my art, I was the person I probably should have been in my whole life. Mm. And then do you think in, in your writing after finding, I guess you would call it finding voice like that, does your brain structurally go like, I have a voice that is outside of New Jersey. I have a voice that is a voice uh, of the Dominican Republic. For instance, the, the intimacy and the tight focus of the stories in Drowner, the stories in the new book, as opposed to the novel, structurally is one thing, just because they're short stories and one is a novel, but also just the scope of, say, um, the Brief Wondrous Life, how it delves into history in a sort of direct way as opposed to the stories, is that, how does your brain or your soul navigate that? That's a weird way of saying, like, do you feel like the more empowered you are to battle the soul, the, the voice in your soul, then you can go like, well, now I actually have to step out in the world and say, like, you know, people are writing some wrong shit about the history of my country, so I'd like to write my own version of that. You know, where, where, do you, where do you wield the weapon with your, your pen? Or does it just come... Yeah. No, I, I, I think that it, depending on the project, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it seems strange, but I... Um, I always think... I just think, you know to recognize the profound injustices of whatever our moment is, is just mm. the norm, it's just a, the expected responsibility of any civic individual. I think that as a civic individual, if you don't have vocabulary for injustice, you're not performing your civic duty. Yeah? Um, that's one thing, well, well that's one thing. But, but I, I guess when I think about my projects for writing, I just, I think there's something, something not larger or more transcendent or more superior. There's something at work here that is about more of a conversation. I mean, I still mm. think, Sean, that I am speaking to the same narrow group of people who I felt that I was stuck on this life raft with throughout my entire, up to the time I was a young adult, like a, to my early 20s. 
I think that if you grow up the way we did, so damn poor, in a society that doesn't like to recognize poor people with that kind of isolation, that kind of like, you know, sense, abiding sense that there's something the matter with you, not that there's a matter. You don't ever sense that there's something wrong with a society that condemns a good portion of its youth to immiseration. You tend to think growing up that there's something wrong with you because you're poor. I think there was a part of me, Sean, whether it's writing a novel or a short story, that is not thinking about anyone else. It's still trying to have this talk with this group of people that I came up with. And the joke is, is that that's the nature of art, from my experience, is that most art is not directed at mm -hmm. an abstract universal. Most art is directed at a very finite audience. And it is in the, sh the way that that finite audience allows us to shape our material that we begin to approach the prerequisites where we begin to enter into what we call the universal. You know, everything that we're reading and every piece of art that we value was written to a, or produced to a, for a very specific group of people in a very specific content, context. Yeah, you can't look at a sculpture and say this was created for the universal. No, this was created in a very specific cultural circuit. Now, we don't like that, right? We like to reverse engineer it. We like to think, well, because we're valuing it, that means that, you know, this piece of art was created with us in mind. No. The Bible was not created with 99% of you in mind. It's tough to remember that. No, I mean, it is tough to remember that. You know, the specific audience didn't imagine. The specific, the audience imagined same with Shakespeare. The audience imagines that Shakespeare didn't involve any of you guys. I can tell you that for a fact. <laughs> and yet, we value it immensely. It's because of the, what makes a piece of work last is the specificity. And so, mm. by stumbling into this conversation with a small group of friends of mine, I stumbled into the secret power of art. And the secret power of art mm. is its specificity. And anyone who attempts to speak or to communicate to people across an abstraction, a universalized abstraction, will find their art robbed of all of its power, and of all of its strengths. And I just stumbled onto this completely by accident. Mm. You know, I was, I was trying to get stuff squared away in my head with my group of friends. Because who was going to understand what I went through? It's not as if people can't connect with you. But when you're having a conversation, don't you want the people who were there in that conversation? Right. So I needed them there. That other people find connection to that, and they find affinity to that, and they're inspired by it, and they're moved by it, speaks to the nature of art. Yeah. It's a, like even like more structurally speaking than like, does something like the novel come to you as like, I should write a novel now, or is it that dialogue that you're having just keeps breaking more and more wide. Well, no, I just, listen, I, I grew up in the Dominican Republic right after the, in the post-dictatorship years. Um, uh, and I was sitting around with my friends, and my friends were like, yo, this is, you know, dictatorships are bad. And I'm thinking, like, that's exactly how we get dictatorships, you know? And I kind of said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to write a book to have this discussion with my friends of how easy it is to authorize a dictatorship. Mm. And so I wrote a book, that, a novel that is an actual textual dictatorship. Yeah. It is a textual dictatorship that everybody, not everyone of course, it's only like three people, but that the average reader <laughs> authorizes without any questions. The average person who gets down with this novel, not that everyone gets down with it, a good portion of people don't get down with any book, but the average person that gets down with this novel doesn't resist this novel as a dictatorship. They tend to get down with it. They tend to be like, I am incredibly powerfully moved by it, you know, which is what most people who support dictatorships feel. But at its core, for me, at the heart of that novel is how easy it is for us to lend libidinal internal energies to structures that are highly authoritative and troubling. 
And it was just something that I wanted to do because I wanted to show my friends that, you know, I wanted to, my argument with my boys was like, and my girls was like, you can persuade people to give up all their authority if you're cute enough. And the cuteness right. might be ideological. No, the cuteness might be ideological. The cuteness might be economical. The cuteness might be cultural. But many of us are really highly vulnerable to cuteness, you know? And I just, I just wanted to go there with them because I thought it would be fun, you know? And then and do, do you think that you, just, you live in a place that is much, I don't know, more, I guess, why, why short stories are such a, a powerful channel for you to, to, to switch into? Is it just the chore of also shaping something large like a novel? No, no, I mean, I, I, shit, I, I take as much time on a short story as I've taken on a novel. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that, look, we could talk all we really want about this stuff, but like, when it comes down to it, most of our lives don't feel like novels. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all of you, but from when I've checked with my friends, our lives do not feel like a fucking Pastor Knock novel. <laughs> you know, they don't feel like a Dennis Johnson novel. Most of us have areas of our lives that we can't even believe we lived them. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's as if it's more like our lives are like a bookshelf where we have four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 12 different novels. They're not like we're this one unified being. I mean, all of us have been, we even were married to people when we look back and we're like, did I even live that life? <laughs> right. You know, who was I? <laughs> and so for me, I guess I felt that the convention of what I would call the convention of the connected short story felt much more, I would say, amenable to the kinds of subjectivities that I experienced and had witnessed around me. Mm. where many of us have chapters in our lives that when they come to an end, they come to an end forever. Mm. And that there's no fitting them in to the standard narrative of a novel where things have to connect and there's a kind of a flow. Yeah, there are ruptures in our lives that I felt mm. were more better approached by this connected short stories. Yeah, because I always say about this, I've said this a million times and it's true, the one comfort of the novel that you don't have in any moment of your life is you know that that novel doesn't end until the last set page, right? There is nothing about your life that can hold that promise, right? Yeah, and I feel like a short story is truer to what we experience, where we get to the end of a short story and then that shit is done forever. Huh. And there are ways that we live that. There are ways that we have loved people, that we have had places, that once we've experienced them, they're gone forever and they never come back. So I think that the form for me huh. was also an attempt to approach a, I would argue, an ethos about the way that we live that I didn't feel a novel always captures as persuasively. I'm not saying a novel cannot. Hmm. This is not an argument for what it can and cannot do, but this is an argument of how much easier it is to portray a life with those kinds of ruptures where uh -huh. the person I was at six couldn't imagine the person I became at nine. The person who was at Rutgers as an undergraduate, I think if my Rutgers self knew I would become this, my Rutgers self would have laid in bed and never gotten out. <laughs> like, but I mean in a bad way, it's just my Rutgers self was attached to a certain form of masculinity that didn't, he didn't want to leave it. You know, and I, I don't think he would have liked this. It would have threatened him immensely. That's really beautiful though, especially looking at the stories too, because reading them, you, you feel, I feel, uh, uh, almost like a ripping away or a, a punch in it. So that makes sense in that, even just structurally or aesthetically, that it needs to be as brief or compact as that moment in, in, in your life. By nature, a novel, the character's greatest love has to be an important part of her novel, right? Let's say the character, a novel, has a, a thread of love. The, the most important love has to be really important. 
Many of us have had really, really important loves, the most important loves of our lives, and yet they are not important to our larger life anymore. Hmm. In that way, our lives are more complex than the standard traditional novel. Many of our greatest right. loves wouldn't make it into the novel of our lives. And I just think that this is a reality, and this hmm. is something that the collected, connected short stories allows me to do. Can I ask you a, a, a structural sure. question then? Then when you write, with the, with the l latest book then, when you write the series, does your brain then go, I'm going to put this two, three, this is going to be seven, or I wrote this one, I feel this is the opening. Mm. You know, where does your brain get into editor mode, I suppose, or curator right. mode? Yeah. Well, first you've got to start with some, you got to start out with some streaks, yeah? With some kind of support beams. So, for example, and these things are usually not visible to the reader. I mean, I organize my stories at the deepest level in ways that I hope aren't immediately visible to my readers. So, this one is, for example, visible. When I began This Is How You Loser in 1996, I said, here's the story I want to write. I want to write the story of the rise and fall of a cheater. All right? Step one. Step two, what is going to show us the rise and fall of the cheater is the rise and fall of a specific kind of masculine imaginary that can't imagine women as fully human. Right. Step two. Step three is that what we're really talking about in this book is a male's ability to withstand and enter into intimacy. And that most of the men that I grew up with, the way that they cope with their terror of intimacy is by somatizing. Is by, at least the guys I grew up with, they build these huge, huge bodies to make themselves more invulnerable and less vulnerable, more invulnerable to, you know, vulnerability and just, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to cope with what your heart feels with your body. Right. Yeah? And step four was that throughout the book, we would see parallel erosions of male bodies and because their inability to deal with intimacy. Junior's body from the beginning to the end, not just in the final chapters, from the beginning to the end, Junior wrestles with the ways that masculine bodies end up expressing the contradictions of their fears of intimacy, of their terrors of intimacy. And so I got those things in place. And once I had those in place, I had to find the stories, mm. the chapters that would work both independently, in other words, someone could read them independently as a story, right. but together to best dramatize these various arcs. And then, of course, there were two other structures, which is I always toggle back and forth between the Dominican Republic and New Jersey. I always try to toggle back and forth between, at minimum, um, uh, at least one voice that's outside of the author presence, which is junior, you know? And then, then I work my way through. It's super intellectual approach, right? Hmm. And the joke is to make sure that nobody thinks it's intellectual. <laughs> well, no, it's true. You know, I mean, last time I checked, I always thought of myself as a super brainy writer. You know, the best part of it is, is that the average reader can read my books and never imagine that right. there's much brain power going in here. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I've always been through this school where I would rather be smart than be known for being smart. And I think the amount of energy people spend being known for being smart, you could read at least 300 books. So right. I try to spend as little energy as possible being known as smart. And it yeah. shows in my books, I would argue. Yeah. You know? did, did the last story then come at, at in the last writing of it? No, the last story was the first thing I started. I started The Cheater's Guide first because I knew it was going to take a long time. I didn't know it was going to take 16 years. Yeah. And I remember when I started in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, uh, there was still a section in it where the, the character is a runner and he always runs into um, a guy dressed up as... Uh, this was in Brooklyn in 1993 when I first moved to Brooklyn. I used to run over the bridge, and I always ran into a young woman walking the other way to the bridge, dressed up as a duck. And she, 
she would like hold up a sign outside of a restaurant. And so me and her every morning, 7 a.m., we should see each other. And that was still in the story, and then it fell out because it sucked. <laughs> can, can we, uh, do you guys want to hear, if you'll uh, have it, read from that last chapter? Sure. I just think it's so Leticia, can I borrow your book? Oh, yeah, that's not going to happen. Leticia's like, of course you have the Spanish version. <laughs> Leticia like, exists someone... in eight languages. Can someone... Oh, uh, thank you, madame. Thank you. Uh, no, I, the honor is mine, madame. Thank you, Sean. So we'll just read a little piece. It's a little awkward. Oh, madame, you have notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Just a small piece. So, um, this character is, uh, you know, throughout his whole book, he's just... He's like, has no connection to intimacy of any kind because he never was shown any by anyone. So he's kind of, he has the weirdest life, you know, because his, his old man like despises him from the moment he meets him. His brother is sort of a weird sociopath who would rather murder him than to seed a point. <laughs> um, and his mother basically treats him as a, as a kind of, as a, a roommate who looks like her, you know? <laughs> and so, no, no, and, I, and his first sexual experiences are with um, a deeply troubling experience where he's basically, um, I mean, technically, he is uh, sexually abused by an older woman, you know? And so, this is a character who's, and he never dramatizes any of this stuff but as the character who knows almost nothing about real intimacy, at least the structures. And so he keeps wondering why every relationship he fucks up. And at the end of the book, he's basically exploded his life, you know, um, found, been found cheating multiple times with his, uh, his, uh, by his fiance who leaves him and never speaks to him again. And the, the book, the last chapter of the book covers like five years of him trying to mourn and finally trying to come to grips with why he is the way he is something he's been doing the whole book, but finally he's got to try to come the last step. And this is at the end of a five-year kind of mourning cycle, you know, where everything he's tried has gone wrong and his body is completely broken down. This, like, the thing he most depended on to maintain his identity as a man, as a tough guy, as a mm -hmm. dude who didn't care about anything, is, like, completely crushed. And he ends up going to the hospital and figuring out that he has got, like, all these fucking issues that are never going to get better, you know? And so, um, and you know, and he never stops thinking about the ex he loses. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because some of us who are the victims of assholes who leave us, you know, it is surprising how much those assholes never stop thinking of their crimes. Yeah. It's probably the way we sleep better. So here's the last section. It's in the second person. Yeah. Some nights you have neuromancer dreams where you see the ex and the boy and another figure familiar waving at you in the distance somewhere very close the laugh that wasn't laughter and finally when you feel like you can do so without blowing into burning atoms you open a folder you have kept hidden under your bed the doomsday book copies of all the emails and the photos from your cheating days, the ones the ex found and compiled and mailed to you a month after she ended it. Dear Junior, for your next book, probably the last time she wrote your name. You read the whole thing cover to cover because, yes, she put covers on it, you are surprised at what a fucking chicken shit coward you are. Mm. It kills you to admit it, but it is true. You are astounded by the depths of your mendacity. When you finish the book a second time, you say the truth. You did the right thing, Negra. You did the right thing. She's right. This would make a killer book, your boy Elvis says. The two of you have been pulled over by a cop and are waiting for Officer Dickhead to finish running your license. <laughs> Elvis holds up one of the photos. She is Colombian, you say, 
and Elvis whistles, Que Viva Colombia, <laughs> hands you back the book, you really should write the cheater's guide to love. You think? I do, he says. It takes a while. You see the tall girl. You go to more doctors. You celebrate Arleni's PhD defense. And then one night you scribble the ex's name and next to it, the half life of love is forever. You bust out a couple of more things. Then you put your head down. The next day, you look at the new pages, and for once, you don't want to burn them or give up writing forever. It's a start, you say to the room. That's about it. In the months that follow, you bend to the work because it feels like hope, like grace, and because you know in your lying cheater's heart that sometimes a start is all we ever get. That's it. Thank you, madame. Wow. Uh, Thank you. Man, hmm. that's a good story. That story hurts, man. Does it hurt to write it? Oh, no. I think. <laughs> trying to untangle here. Here we go. I mean, sure. I, I think part of the nature of it is. Um, I mean, you can't speak for anyone. Yeah, we try, and I will try, but in the end, that's what always is the barrier. I just, I, I can't imagine how anyone could generate books any faster. I just, I, I don't understand. I think that there's a part of me who believes that you really, you have to go in at a certain level which defies easy production. Mm. I mean, that's just probably a self-serving metric, no question. You know, perhaps people are just easier at it than I am. They just find it easier than I do. I guess that's, that's why it feels it always takes a long time because the answer to your question is I think it's incredibly hard to write anything that in some ways exposes and makes you vulnerable. And I guess mm. maybe it's because I'm not that interested in making the readers vulnerable as much as I am interested in making me vulnerable and I'm supposed to be the the model for them, you know? So, but, I mean, whatever, I don't know. So maybe I'm just slow, but it's, it is always hard. I mean, but there's something what you're saying, too, because I always think when I read any of your things, the, the voice is so clear, and so to hear you re read it out loud, too, does that, you have a, I guess you have a distance from it? I mean, the, one of the profound things about his writing, right, is how real and impactful it is and how you do that mastery of when you read it. That's why everyone at these things is like, yo, is that you in the thing? Because you write it so, so nakedly. Whether it's you or not really doesn't matter, but that you write it with that effect. And so I guess that's what I mean. Like, does it, it sure. hurts to hear it because it feels real to me. It feels like, like something I've done, I suppose. Right. I think a lot of us have experience with that. I, I just guess that when I think about the aspect of any text that we call intimacy that's a strategy. In other words, you can deeply desire to connect to your reader, and you can feel like you're confessing and exposing yourself, but that's basically, huh. that's perhaps your motivation, perhaps your impulse, perhaps your ethos. But to actually create intimacy on the page is a strategy. And that takes a totally different kind of work, you know, because everyone knows people who gleefully confess more than they should, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't seem to take, it doesn't seem, look, this is a country and this is a cultural moment that rewards you for vomiting your deepest, darkest secrets out as soon as you can. That's very different right. than the textual work that is necessary to provoke intimacy, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so I always think that, sure, at one hand, there's an impulse for me to sort of reach across the divides that holds me and my reader apart, but when it comes down to it, most of the work that people think of as the, most of the stuff that makes the book feel even emotionally alive or feel like someone you might know, that's all a bunch of literary and textual strategies that you've mm -hmm. got to work on really, really hard. 
And so I, I find myself thinking of the two very distinct things. As an artist, I need the challenge that the book implicates and reveals me. But then there is, as the writer, as the person who actually has to craft this stuff, I've got to come up with strategies equal to my desire. And that, to me, has always taken an enormous amount of time. Yeah? Because whatever comes easy in this area for these strategies is always one step beneath what you need. You know? So I just, I kind of always find myself spending 10, 11 years on a story because it takes a long time to conceive the strategy that would communicate yeah. what I need. Okay. Should we do thing? I think it's Q&A. Yeah. I'm going to stand for Q&A. I've had it. Thank you. Don't clap, but thank you. Thank you, Sean. Got a question back here. Now, Juno, you are an, an immigrant, obviously, but you are clearly a Dominican York. Now, I'm just curious, specifically, because you mentioned about your siblings. What specifically made you write about the island the way you were? And as a two-part question, how has your work been received on the island? Right. One, I, I think I write about the island um, the way I wrote and in the way I kind of write about it because. Again, this is, more, this is more of a characterological thing. You know, my kind of protagonist and the guy who supposedly writes my books, Junior, um, he is really fluent in New Jersey and in Santo Domingo. Like, this is a dude who knows what the hell he's talking about, which is why he lies so well. And even when Junior intentionally goes out of his way to like misdirect people. He does it in the way that best hides what he knows. And so part of the reason I write about the island that way is because it, it reinforces Junior's outlook. This is somebody who knows these two spaces at a level that people who have been there their whole lives would be challenged by. I mean, that was always the joke. I always thought that everyone likes to think that your connection to a place is additive. In other words, that if you're there for 40 years, you know, that you know more than someone who's been there for 10 years. We love that fantasy, right? Because that fantasy supports us, but that fantasy is not true. And it hurts us to think that. It hurts us to think that it might be possible for people to short circuit that. And I always thought Junior knows the island better than people who live there their whole lives. And Union knows New Jersey better than people who have been there their whole life. And that was the joke. Uh, the second part of it is how come, um, uh, how is the, the book received on the island? Well, you got to understand, it's hard, I always say, to generalize about collectives. We're also talking about a country that very much shares with the United States, kind of an aversion to literary culture, you know? <laughs> um, there's, there's, there are structural reasons, too, which make this more of a challenge in the Dominican Republic. Um, you know, the average person in San Domingo is not going to kick up the loot for a paperback book. You know, it's a lot of money. And there's basically like one real corporate bookstore on the whole island. You know, and so circulation, whoa, I'll run over here. <laughs> circulation is uh, difficult. So, I mean, you know what? There's plenty of people think about it. I always think most of my reactions when I go to Santo Domingo tend to be about how do people think about Dominican immigrants back home. You know, most people ain't responding to my book, they're responding to me. So if you got mm. problems with people who left Santo Domingo and came back with like Ivy League educations but are still real kind of Negro-ish, you're going to be like, fuck you and your work. And I find that happens a lot. I find that happens a lot. I rarely get arguments about what might be the shortcomings of my book, except that I'm not Dominican enough. It's a funny argument. I've always loved that one. Yeah, thank you, my brother. There's a question up here. Do you want to just yell and I'll repeat? Oh, wait, there's something else? We're going to do the next one over here on this side. I just wanted to thank you for two things. One, my family's from Patterson, and thank you for writing about Patterson. Oh, P-Town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And second, 
when Oscar Wilde came out, my family was going through a very bad time for, from a very traumatic event. And the fallout for me was that I was unable to read. And your book allowed me to read again. It was written in such a style huh. that I can only call revolutionary. I will never get over all those footnotes. And you gave me the gift of reading back. And I wanted to thank you for that. You're very kind. That's thank up. you, madame. That's what's up. We have a question over here, Jim. Do you write in Spanish or in English? And do you interpret your own work into Spanish if you write in English? No, no, no. I, I uh, write predominantly in a, a non-English. And I, I live my life interpreting both my languages. Yeah. And it's, it's the way I live. I, if I'm speaking in English, I'm checking it against what I know. If I'm speaking in Spanish, I'm checking it against what I know. It's an interesting... I'm asking, I'm asking in terms of your published work. No, no, no. It's, that's what I said. It's a, it's a, I, I write in a non-English, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Next question on this side. I mean, I, I wasn't being dismissive. I just meant that, like, I, I came up being told that the way I spoke and write wasn't English for so long that I'm always like, right. yeah, it's, it's, it's a non-English. <laughs> You know? So in my mind, I always thought it was kind of English, but so, so often people were like, you know, it's sort of if you have an accent and people are like, oh, you don't speak English. I felt like I had this permanent accent called Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it would be recognized by linguists as English, but I didn't experience, that's not what people told me. Dale. Yeah. There's a follow-up, madame, I see. Yeah, well, um, do you do the translation when, when your non-English is translated into Spanish? Do you do that translation? Is there, so a, third, is, is there a third question? I want to make sure to get them all. No, because, because, because one of, one of, one of the, um, the guests here has your book in Spanish, and so I was curious as sure, to whether sure, or not sure. you... No, no, I hear you. I just want to make sure is there another one. And I'm not teasing. I'm not actually teasing you. I'm not, I'm not taking the piss out. Okay. I, um, no, no, I, I, I work with the translators. I, I, again, unless, unless you're a fucking the man, chances are you, it's, it's, be, it's hard enough to write well <laughs> in one language. Yeah. So I work with the translators, but I don't got fucking even one thousandth of the talent that would be required to translate my book into a language which is my native language. <laughs> I mean... Word. It's true. I think we, we, we don't we underestimate the important work that translators do. Yeah. Um, so I've read that you've said in an interview, so it's completely up for interpretation, right? Um, that your work expresses a question around decolonial love. Um, and I'm wondering if what you're doing, particularly with This Is How You Lose Her, describing how loving someone else who's broken by the coloniality of power is possible or maybe why it's impossible. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's impossible, clearly, because I think that it's the, it's the way through to having authentic selves and communities. I think that the, for all of us, when we think about what this society imposes upon us a set of values where we're not supposed to find people of color beautiful, we're not supposed to find women as human, we're not supposed to find poor people as important as rich people, we're not supposed to find incapacity or differently abled as, you know, youthful as folks who are fully abled. When we think about all the ways that we bear and carry these economies inside of us. Um, the inco these economies have this way of dehumanizing every aspect of us. And so when I think about decolonial love, I'm not just thinking about it in the way that it's been used by people far more interesting and smarter than me. I'm thinking about it in the lowercase way that we carry all these colonial regimes about, to mm. quote Arundhati Roy, who can be loved and how much. And I think that the true test, of course, of your ability to love yourself is to love someone else who has come up through this same exact experience. Yeah. I think that cross-racial, you know, what we would call 
cross-racial romances, we love to think about them and we love to have little stories about them. But for many of us, um, you know, we grew up in a civilizational moment where the, the idea, the audacity of loving someone of your skin color is a revolutionary act, man. It's just a revolutionary act. And I think it's a conversation that you enter with yourself to admit that you're carrying these regimes in you. I mean, I, 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 when I grew up, I always thought so many of us were avoiding people who were just like us because they triggered these regimes in us and they triggered the agony of these regimes. So I don't think that the books were meant to say that they're impossible. Uh, I just think that the books are meant to say that this shit is hard and that it begins with a profound, honest sort of assessment, which is what, you know, people like Bell Hooks, you know, people like Adrian Rich, people like Toni Morrison were talking about when they were bringing up these ideas to the front in the 80s. You know? Yeah, thank you. Next question is over here. Um, could you see any of your stories taking on new lives um, in other mediums, like movies and TV? Um, and also, are there any other artistic uh, mediums that you personally enjoy? I mean, I, of course, I enjoy tons of stuff. I enjoy movement. You know, like those of you who are in dance here, like I think movement is like it. You know, but I mean, I don't know. I think, I, I don't know if I could see it, but I could imagine if somebody was like stubborn and felt like interpreting something for a screen, I'm sure they, they might be successful. I guess I'm open to the idea, but I'm not capable of it. So for me, it's, it's like fantasizing about flight, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice if someone gave it a shot, but who knows, you know? I know I, I should be less fucked up, right? I should be like, yeah, <laughs> can't wait to see it into a fucking movie. This shit's gonna be bomb. It's gonna be outrageous, son. It's gonna give the book new life. It's gonna give me new life. I don't know, I'm just, I'm amazed that anybody reads this stuff, so I'm just like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Next question on the side. Hi, you've uh, spent, uh, you just said, uh, 10 years trying to develop uh, strategies, literary strategies and textual strategies to create intimacy. And I was wondering if you could share some of those discoveries that you've made, some of the textual uh, strategies that you've used and invented. Yeah, no, they're in the book. <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I don't mean that as dismissive. I just mean that part of why books as artifacts are important is because the answer to your questions are there. And I don't think the answer to the question is anything that I say, you know. It is in the process of looking to, for that answer in these books where you will get your answer. And anything else will rob you of the exact answer you need. So the very fact that if I start listing them to you, you will no longer have access to them. But if you engage in a conversation with the book and with the questions, you may begin to approach them, you know? And I know that sounds like fancy footwork, but it's actually incredibly true, yeah? The thing about artistic strategies is that one has to involve themselves in a process to begin to discover them. And anything that short circuits the process takes them away from you, you know? Yeah, thank you. Next one's over here. This is the last question. Oh. I have a question. Madame? No, I have a statement. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think this is probably the first time that you have spoken in, on the West Coast that there was someone from Perth Amboy, New Jersey. It is not, but I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very happy. What street, madame? What street? I lived uh, on Woodruff Place, which was off High Street. I know it. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to work off of Elm at the uh, really? Rar Raritan River to Steel. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm sorry I missed you in Perth there, boy. <laughs> God, I was... <laughs> in those days, I was uh, very... I was very dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Next question over here. <laughs> oh, okay, then. We would have been a pair. No, no, it's okay, then. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I was wondering how your writing or the 
kind of consciousness around masculinity that you've come through with your writing and your journey has impacted your relationship with other men and or expanded the conversations with that original crew that you were writing for? Yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that um, conversations about sort of large forces are best had in collectives. I, I just don't think that one can begin to approach what masculinity, how it lives inside of us as an individual. The truth of the matter is that none of these conversations would have been possible um, for me if I hadn't been having them collectively with my friends. So it wasn't as if I was some like strange, you know, Promethean outlier who discovered this thing about masculinity and brought the fire to the group. It was that as a group, we were having these conversations and it was only by the group having these conversations that I began to be aware of what was at stake. And so in fact, by the time I kind of got around to writing the book, it was sort of like leaving a record of a comet that already passed, you know? Mm. The book for me is just archeology span of, of a shift in my group of friends that I not only witnessed but participated and lived. So it would be the opposite, you know? And these books wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have a group of boys who were wrestling with these questions simultaneously. You know, thank you. Next one's over here. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for coming to California. Um, means a lot. I drove from LA yesterday to, to come up and see you. Oh, my boyfriend with me. Oh, <laughs> you guys are so cute. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> but um, I Sean, we never get that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question though. Um, I guess, which authors or literary works influenced you the most? Because you mentioned Neuromancer, and I thought maybe science fiction or science fiction authors might have influenced sure. you. Sure, of course, many, many of them. Everyone from Harlan Ellison to Samuel R. Delaney. Yeah, I mean, again, this is, this is a game you don't want to start with me, because once I start listing all the people that I really feel like I stole most from, it'll go on and on. <laughs> you know, I, Edward Rivera's family installments, Anjana Apachana's um, incantations and other stories, Michael Martone's uh, Fort Wayne is seventh on Hitler's list. Um, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, would you want more? No. Oh, okay. I can do more. I'm like really boring about books. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last two on this side. How'd you know? Oh. Uh, so you said you've worked on stories for 10 years or more. How do you know when to stop? That's an easy question to answer. The, look, if you're, if you're an artist and you're having problems with your form, like knowing whether the thing is done, part of it is you probably haven't metabolized enough of your form. So for me, luckily, I'm such a fucking serious reader that what happens with me with every book is that every, for example, for a novel, Right? Every novel that I had read stood up and said done when Oscar Wilde was finished. And with me, every time I'm writing a story, every short story I've ever read sits up inside of me and says done when I'm finished with a short story. And I think that's the only judge that we have is our material, is our like, actual convention. Anything else is, I think, usually just executive level ego, you know? I think when I write something and it can f live with all the stuff I've read, I know that I've done well. And it's usually all the other stories inside of me that keep me on my toes. It's never some... If it was career stuff, which I'm not saying this is anything you're talking about, but I think many of us write with an ideas for career. We're like, we want to finish this because someone told us that if our piece isn't done by X time, we will be a failure to humanity. You know, That's, that's not what gets art done. Art gets done because the rest of the art inside of you begins to recognize it as family. Mm. Not because you've set up this kind of artificial, you know, artificial framework of reward. You will be a good person if you finish. You'll be worthy of love if you finish. You will be famous if you finish. You're going to get money if you finish. And so for me, it's always that the, once the rest of what I have adored and I have read recognizes what I've written as family, I'm like, 
on to the next 12-year horror. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, last question. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Union, of course, has one foot in the Dominican, one foot in New Jersey. The other part that's remarkable to me and perhaps a more unusual story is one foot in the neighborhood and the other foot in a very erudite academic uh, world. For example, on page 94 of the Pura Principle, he talks about his brother's girlfriend had the hugest donkey on the planet, and then a couple of <laughs> lines later, uh, he came home so garbled that he sounded as if he was speaking, and you expect Greek, it's an Aramaic, oh, my God. So, um, uh, do we need to go back to Oscar Wilde to find the background story, and mm. how unusual is this, and, and how stressful is it for the immigrant who has uh, one foot in the neighborhood with folks that are not going to get out of the neighborhood and the others that are going to go on to the Ivy Leagues. Sure. I mean, I, I've always, this might seem like a bit of sophistry, but I've always felt that to be is, seems to be kind of easy. To be in a society that wants to revoke most of our humanity, that's where it's really hard. You know, and I, I think that someone like Junior is, I think, again, I said earlier, part of what is interesting about Junior is his unwillingness to dramatize what's clearly to a reader profoundly important aspects of who he is. Junior has no interest in dramatizing why he's so damn smart. I mean, he just doesn't. He doesn't ever seem to think this shit is abnormal. And that's what's really kind of fascinating about him. I mean, I guess I grew up in a neighborhood where there were so many people who were so goddamn smart. And it, it just seemed like a natural thing that there was always going to be, in every context, two or three people who were damn smart. And certainly I would argue that most of our lives are asking us to deny or revoke or to marginalize other aspects of our lives. I think that it's enormous amount of, it takes an enormous amount of imagination to maintain the complexity required to keep us held, yeah? So in other words, our past and our present and our future, it takes a lot of imagination to keep all of those things together. Usually we abandon one because it's too much work. Being from, let's say, uh, a tradition that is not itself intellectual, but being intellectual yourself, takes a lot of imagination to sort of bridge these two things together. But most of us, that imagination is called a self, so it's probably not a bad idea to pursue it. I just think we're rarely encouraged to. And I, I, one of the things is with a character like Junior is I give him so many problems that to make up for the problems, I have to give him certain kinds of supernatural, preternatural strengths. And one of the ways, one of the preternatural strengths that Junior has is his lack of interest in talking about how smart he is in a society where you're encouraged, if you have a nice resume, to wave it in front of everybody as soon as you can. I mean, if you got stuff, this is a society that says, tell people. Or for those of us who we started talking about Cambridge, it's the impulse which has me, as soon as I meet a student from Harvard, has me counting in my head, starting at one, to see how many seconds before he tells me he's from Harvard. <laughs> yeah, so, and I just, Junior is that guy who you could spend the rest of your life counting, and he would never say, for mm -hmm. very complicated reasons. Well, thank you guys so much. You've been very kind. And Sean, thank you so much. Thanks.